Anybody here for the first time? Yeah, we have a couple. If you could give them, you could just uh, <clears throat> fill that out for us so we can stalk you. Go on Facebook, know everything about you. Please put your credit card down. We will use that number and it'll be for your benefit. Amen? No, we just want a record of your visit and just let you know things. We appreciate you being with us this morning. You can tell if you're visiting, we don't, we don't put a whole emphasis on giving. We, we look at it like this. If you're blessed, you're a giver. Because you want other people to have that kind of blessing, right? You know, it's, it's got to switch to where we no longer are giving to get. If you're giving to get, you're still under a curse. Hello. If that's your mindset. You know that curse that you need to get away with is you're cursed if you don't tithe. How many know that that's not that's not good? The, the next thing is I understand that there's reaping and sowing, and that's good, but we don't want you to stay there. Because reaping and sowing is man's law. I mean, God put it into effect, but man's the one that started it. Y'all out there? Why? Adam never sowed to get the garden. God planted the garden. So how many know, I'd rather live in the law of blessing Amen. than reaping and sowing. You know, you say, what is that? That's your promised land with houses you didn't build, wells you didn't dig, vineyards. Okay, y'all not very encouraged about that. <laughs> I guess we won't teach you how to operate in it. I mean, because that is a maturity process. It's that 30, 60, 100. And, you know, there's too much for us to do to operate in the 30. Or in the 60s. You know, I told people a long time ago, the call that is on our life, tithing's not going to get it done. It's just not. And if you've got to beg people and curse people to get them to give money, you're probably in the wrong business. And that's my opinion. Lead me to it, right? When we first started preaching this, people say, well, if you do that, you won't have no money. You, you can't do church. Then don't do church. Because if that's the system, hey, Miss Peggy, glad to see you. Um, glad you're back here this morning. If you have to do that to, quote, do the kingdom, something's wrong. Amen? All right, let's go into this this morning. Um, turn over with me to Matthew, and we'll, we'll jump in where we've been. We, we've been talking to you about Moses and the covenant that God made uh, with Israel or with Moses, which is the Moazic, Moag covenant. Yeah, what she said. <clears throat> and the last two weeks, we've shown you what Jesus has done. And I told you that part of what is coming is a revelation not only of Jesus' birth, but the cross, and then also the judgment of what happened at 70 AD. And the reason we know that was a judgment is because it removed the sacrificial system of the law that the Jews were continually to practice 40 years after the cross. And most of the church don't even understand what happened there. Uh, Daniel really lays it out and says it'll be a sign to you that when this is removed and completely removed, it means something. Matter of fact, and, and Paul says it like this, that he that now letteth until he be taken out of the way. And what he was talking about, what taken out of the way, is that sacrificial law system that had to be totally removed. Once you understand some of those things, it shifts how you see everything. Because when Peter got up and said, it's the last days, and then John, in the book of John, he said, it's the last hour. How many knows he's talking about, talking about the end of the world? But we've been taught that's the end of the world. No, they were Jews. See, the reason we don't understand what they were saying is because we don't understand the whole Bible. And so that's some of what I'm going to give you today. And in February, um, oh, let me, let me make this announcement. Sorry, we forgot last week. Uh, we're going to start Wednesday nights back up after the conference. I didn't want to start something and have to go into the conference. So the Wednesday after the conference, we'll go back into doing Wednesday nights again. Does that make sense? And then... Uh, once I get back from Asia, we will start a school on how to live in the fullness of God. And so um, I'm excited about that. It's, it's going to be good. 
um, but it's going to it'll probably be 10 to 12 uh, sessions or and if you understand Wednesday night we don't do praise and worship so it's just solid two hours of teaching and so it's where I just really get to break down this to you and I felt like this last week God said start showing me look I want you to do this I want you to lay this out for people now I know a lot of people got a lot of things going on look all I can do is make it available if you want it you can come is that good all right where was I at I was right here. I ain't went anywhere. What are y'all talking about? So, I want you to understand this. The prophets prophesied it. Jesus fulfilled it. And the apostles confirmed it. Those three things have to line up for you to understand the Bible. So, we have a lot of people out there, and there's a lot of ministries out there. And I'm not coming against those ministries. These are good people. But... You can't go back to Old Covenant Scripture and always quoting Old Covenant Scripture for the time we're living in now. Because every bit of that has to come through the cross. And it has to stop at the cross because Jesus fulfilled all of that. If he didn't, then he lied. And if he lied, how are you going to come and worship a liar? Now listen, that's not my opinion. It's in red in your Bible. It said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. I believe he did what he said he did. He finished it. The problem is we don't understand what he finished. So today we're going to go back into that. I'm going to show you some things. I can't say rock your world anymore. I'm going to show you some things that are going to really going to help you. <laughs> because you read scripture and you read it like he's talking to you. And because you read it like that in a Western mindset, you don't have a clue of what he's saying. That's why we have so many people that's taught on Revelation that it's so bad. Okay? Because you will never understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand the book of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. Because so much of Revelation is pulling from those three books. Oh, y'all got quiet on me. Okay. So I want you to see it like this. As we were talking about, there's, there's five covenants that we've been talking about. And when I do the fullness thing, I'll do all of them. But we have the Noadic covenant, which was a promise. <clears throat> okay, now, most people don't even understand what that promise was because we see the rainbow in the sky, right? And God will never destroy the earth with water again. Did you know, it's not just what he's talking about, water. Because how many knows he didn't destroy the earth? Come on, did he destroy the earth? No. What did he destroy? The people. What's he saying? He said, I'm making a covenant with you that he'll never destroy the people again like that. You know, but, but what we do is we go, see, he'll not do it with water. But we'll go over here in Revelation and go, but fire's going to get you. He didn't say nothing about fire. He just said water. Come on, that's ignorance before breakfast. So you have to understand when he's making a covenant, if his word is no good, his name is no good. That's why all through the Gospels and all through the New Covenant, you always see them making reference, and we're going to show you that today. They're making reference to what Jeremiah said, what David said, what Abraham said. Why? Because he came to fulfill something. What? Everything. Everything. Come on, he said he's reconciling all things in Christ. So if Christ showed up in the fullness of time, what was he coming to do? Reconcile all things in himself. When did that happen? Come on, at the cross. You can say it. It's not a trick question. He's the one that said he finished it at the cross. Now, we know there's a 40-year transition period there where there's some things that he finished had to be taken care of why? Because he did that out of his mercy and his grace. How many knows David was anointed to be king while they were still a king? Does anybody know the story of David? How many knows Saul still was king for 40 years? So here God initiated a new covenant while the old covenant was still in place. For how long? How about when he brought him out of Egypt to go into the promised land? How long did they stay? 40 years in the wilderness before they went into the promised land. 
Are you following me? Okay, so I want you to understand as we talked about this covenant with Moses and we showed you what Jesus did for you on the cross, hopefully you got some revelation that excited you that Jesus took all those plagues that you were afraid of that was going to come on you, right, from last week. To this, today what we're going to do is we're going to take you into the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant or the David, the covenant he made with David. So anybody know what the Abrahamic covenant is? He made a covenant with Abraham. And now when he did this, he put Abraham to sleep. How many knows Abraham had nothing to do with the covenant? Come on, sounds like the kingdom, doesn't it? So he tells him he's going to make him great. Going to make him the father of nations. Changes his name and gives him Ham's inheritance. So he names him Abraham. Because Ham rejected his inheritance. God gave it to Abram. So if you don't want yours, I'll take it. Not, not only does he do this, he tells him all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Now, how many knows that's a covenant, but it's also a promise? So did Jesus fulfill that on the cross? He was the fulfillment of it. Was everybody blessed through Abraham's seed, which is Jesus? Yes. So how many knows that covenant's been fulfilled? Are y'all out there? Now, the other covenant we're going to talk about is the covenant that he made with David, which kind of is different than all the rest. Now, these two are both grant covenants. A grant covenant means you have a higher king that makes a covenant with a lesser king. Why? Just because he chooses to. Just because he's good. Remember when David wanted to build a house for God? And then God, because of that, was moved by it and said, this is what I'm going to do for you. You know, on your throne, or on my throne, your seed will sit forever. Okay? So we're, we're going to go into some. Now, the reason I want you to understand this, you're going, what, 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 what difference did all that make? You're going to see today. And you're going to see scriptures that you've read in the new covenant, you don't understand because you're detaching it from the fulfillment of what Jesus came to do. Once you see that, you start to go, oh my gosh, he wasn't talking to me at all. He was talking to them to fulfill what he promised. Why is that important? Because if, if he's that just that he fulfilled everything from the old into the new, how many knows he's not going to lie to you? And it shows you the character and integrity of God that when he says something, it's the way it is. You say, well, I hadn't seen the manifestation of it yet. That don't change that it's not true. Can you hold that seed till it manifests? Well, y'all quiet this morning. Y'all got Texans on your mind? Y'all better engage or they won't play good. Matthew chapter 1. Let me make this statement that will challenge you. I've said it before, but some of you were not here. God never told us to live by the Bible. Let me say that again. God never told us to live by the Bible. People that live by the Bible are going to argue with you and fight with you over what's right and wrong. He said you will live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Most of the people that want to argue with you about the Bible don't even believe that God speaks today. If that's the case, then your belief system is not based on relationship. It's based on a book. Paul said it like this, the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. So if you try to understand the book by the letter, you're going to die. It's going to kill you. That's why I was telling you earlier, if you're trying to figure it out, you're dying. Because you can only get it by the Spirit. Come on, if, they, if the men were inspired to write the books by the Spirit, it's going to take the Spirit to reveal to you the revelation of what they wrote. And so most of the time, and you know, I don't always tell people this because you know, people try to do what you do. You've got to find out what works for you. But when God highlights something to me and he speaks, I shut the book. And then I go to him out of relationship and hold that until he brings the revelation up of what he spoke in his book. 
Because I have the right to know because the book tells you it's a mystery. But he said, to the sons, I give the right to know the mysteries. So if I have a right to know the mysteries, I'm not going to try to figure it out in the book. It doesn't mean I don't study. It doesn't mean I don't cross-reference. It doesn't mean I don't go back and do history. I put all those things with it. But at the end of the day, God, what are you saying? <coughs> Excuse me. Are, are you following me? And that's why, you know, when you get into arguments and people say, well, look here, didn't I, I did this and I'll show you this. And I said, yeah, but did God say that? Well, no. Well, then I got you. It's like I was talking to my sister and, and we were talking about something um, that we have to do. And, and, and she said, I love you. I said, well, I love you more. And she said, not possible. I said, with, all, all, with God, all things are possible. <laughs> she said, you got me. And I said, I know. <laughs> Don't mess with the man that makes his living by how he speaks. Because <laughs> his words are just actions of his thoughts and as of his belief system. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about y'all. Yes. So Matthew chapter 1. So I want you to get this. For 400 years, God has not spoken. Come on, in between the Old Covenant and New Covenant, it's been 400 years. So don't you think that Matthew 1.1 1, 1 ought to be important? How come you've never read it? Now, I'm sure you read it, but until I asked you, you couldn't tell me what it said. Uh, Matthew 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Oh, somebody talk to me now. So in other words, he hadn't spoken for 400 years. And now the first thing that he does is give you a revelation of why Jesus is coming. And the reason he's coming, he's going to fulfill what Abraham said and what David said. Because he's making known to you that he's the son of Abraham and he's the son of David. And being a son means it means to be a builder of the family name. So if you're a builder of the family name, he came to what? Build the name that God spoke to Abraham that I am. Come on, that he spoke to David. These are things that if you don't understand this, then you're going to go over here and read things and you don't think he's talking to you when he's not talking to you. He actually came to fulfill everything from the old. It'll get better. Hang on. Luke chapter 1. Very familiar passage. And this is where Gabriel shows up and he's telling... Zechariah, that he's going to have a kid. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. <clears throat> now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now, this is after he came into agreement that he's going to have a son. His name was going to be John. Are y'all following me? Y'all know who I'm talking about? Zacharias and Elizabeth. You know, and at first he didn't agree with God, so God shut his mouth. So make sure it happened. You know, sometimes God has to shut your mouth to make sure it's happened because your doubt and unbelief will kill it. <laughs> Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited, redeemed his people, and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So here's Zechariah. John the Baptist is now, quote, being born, but he doesn't start prophesying over John. He first starts prophesying about David. Are you with me? As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, we have been since the world begun, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, to the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies may serve him without fear. So what is he doing? The first thing he does, he starts prophesying about the Messiah, not his son, John. And when he's prophesying about the son or Messiah, he talks about who? David and Abraham. Because the Messiah or Jesus is coming to fulfill the covenant that he made with Abraham and with David. Are you following me? 
Acts chapter 3. Verse 25. Your sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So who's he talking about? Abraham. Man, y'all are quiet. Come on, how many knows this is the promise he made Abraham? And here Luke is telling you in the book of Acts what Jesus did on the cross. That through him all of his seed would be. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed. Now think about this. This is so important because I want you to under, understand everything in our world tells us we got to do something to get blessed. How did Abraham get blessed? God showed up and said, hey, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And you're going to be the father of this. So here Luke is picking it up, prophesying what Jesus did on the cross so you could understand you come from that lineage. You're blessed. That promise was not only to you but to your children that what? You're going to be blessed. Why? Because God chose to bless you. Not anything you could do, nothing about your behavior. God just shows up and goes, hey, Abram, I'm going to bless you. Thank you. I'll take that. That's what he's trying to tell you. He's trying to show you that you're blessed. He's trying to show you it's nothing about your behavior. You can't do anything to get it. Watch this. You ain't going to like it, but you need to come into alignment with it. You can't do anything to lose it. Why? Because if you could, you'd have lost it a long time ago. You say, yeah, but you know, I mean, I, this happened in my life. Yeah, but God didn't do that. Your sin did that because sin carries its own punishment. Yeah. Yeah. But God didn't punish you. Back to Luke chapter 1. I'm just setting a foundation where I can go with this, so just stay with me. Luke chapter 1. Verse 32, and he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, who is this? He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Who's he going to be? That, that, that's representing Jesus. Do you all know that? Say it again. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of who? His father, David. Why is this important? Because there's a lot of churches out there preaching the Davidic covenant has not been fulfilled. There's still yet something to happen. So let's look at the four things that he promised David. Turn with me to Samuel, 2 Samuel. Why, why do we need to see this? So that we can see he fulfilled it and it belongs to you. Is it all right? So we're interpreting Bible with Bible. This is not my idea. It's what God said. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. You will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. My mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul when I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever forever. Before you, your throne shall be established forever. So here's four things that he promises David. Your name will be great. You'll be the son of God. Okay? In other words, you remember what they called? Remember when blind Bartimaeus, what did he cry out? Jesus, son of David. Now, what did that mean? Why did Jesus stop? Here's Jesus going through the crowd. 
He's going outside the city. Here's some crazy blind man screaming at him, and the people are saying, be quiet. And he gets louder. And here you can see Jesus going on, and he says, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops. Why would that cry stop Jesus? Because Jesus understands what he came to do. And he came to fulfill the covenant of David and of Abraham. And so he knows this guy has a revelation of who he is. And when he gets that revelation, it stops him and says, bring that boy to me. At that point, he don't know he's blind. He don't know anything about him. Now, blind Bartimaeus knows when Jesus is bringing him to me, he left his garment. When he left his garment, it was a representation, watch this, that Jesus has heard me. Jesus is responding to me, so I will not be the same when I encounter Jesus. The garment is what they gave him that gave him the right to beg. Because the garment identified him as being blind. So people would see him and feel sorry for him because he's blind. And, and they were, you know, it was actually a law that you had to give to them. Come on, are you with me? But when he says, son of David, have mercy on me, he's making reference to the covenant that God made with David. And that Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant. So Jesus says, bring him to me. Blind Bartimaeus says, hey, I'm going, but I'm leaving my garment because I ain't going to need that thing no more. Because I'm making a demand on the covenant. And if he breaks the covenant, hello, then he ceases to be God. So whatever he promised David belongs to him. So I, let me give you some advice. Don't call him blind Bartimaeus because he ain't blind no more. Now watch what happens when he gets there. <clears throat> Jesus said, what do you want? Uh, duh, I'm blind. <laughs> How many of he wasn't just asking for his healing? Yeah. Come on, if you got the revelation of Jesus Christ, why would you just settle for one attribute of who he is? I promise you, blind Bartimaeus is probably an incredible evangelist after that. Wow. Are you all right? He will inherit the throne of David, and his kingdom will never end. Now, these are the four promises he made to David. His name would be great. He's the son of God. The throne of David that you would inherit, and the kingdom would never end. Now, we have a big problem with that because we don't understand the kingdom. See, a lot of people think the kingdom showed up when Jesus showed up in Matthew. The kingdom existed before the earth ever existed because the kingdom is in the king. That's why when Jesus was born, he's born king. Are you following me? <clears throat> That's why a lot of times we, we look at this thing and we say, well, we're grace people. Well, I understand you're grace people, but grace is part of the kingdom. The kingdom's not part of grace. Because Jesus didn't preach grace. He preached kingdom. Y'all right? The kingdom existed before the foundation of the world because it's inside the king. Now, I'm not diminishing grace. I'm just trying to show you the attribute of the kingdom is grace. You okay? All right. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be. Okay, now I want to stop there just for a second. <clears throat> Why will there be no end to his kingdom? Because it had no beginning. How can you end something that never had a beginning? Because everything, watch this, everything outside the kingdom was created. Everything outside of God was created. God is the only thing that was not created. And if the kingdom is in him, the, ki the kingdom was not created. It is who he is. It's the nature. It's the character. It's the fullness of the Godhead. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with that because they say, well, we're moving, moving into a new age. Show me that in the Bible. 
Because I just read to you that we're in the kingdom. And the kingdom has no end. And the increase of his government, it will always increase. And that's what Daniel prophesied. Daniel prophesied that there is a kingdom coming. And in this kingdom, there is no end of this kingdom. And of that government, it's only increase. So let me ask you something. When did the kingdom show up? On earth. When the king showed up. <laughs> Come on, it wasn't when Jesus started preaching the kingdom. When the king came, the kingdom came with him. That's why I taught you how even the angels were, were, were shouting and proclaiming, you know what? Peace on earth and goodwill towards all men. Why? There was a celebration that the king and the kingdom had come to the planet. That's why in Galatians it says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. So if that was the fullness of time, we're not living, oh, we're not living in something that had a beginning and an end. We're living in something called the kingdom. And the kingdom had no beginning and end. And if you understand this in maturity, you can go both ways. Moses understood this in an old covenant. Everybody else had to go through a system, not Moses. Why? Because Moses went into the encounter on the mountain. Moses encountered the glory. Moses went backwards and wrote five books of the Old Testament. Moses went forward and met with Jesus and Elijah. Why? See, there's the kingdom. Okay. Moses encountered the kingdom when most of them didn't even know the kingdom existed. They were still operating through a covenant. Come on, because they didn't want to be kings and priests with God. Once you understand that God, listen, I'm not against the five-fold ministry, but the five-fold ministry is to equip you that you come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ to understand Revelation 5. He wants you to be kings and priests on the earth. Kings and priests on the earth encounter God. They have a relationship with him. They can hear him. They can encounter him. And as maturity comes in you, you realize you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, there's no beginning and end. So you can go backwards and forwards. Come on, it's like playing checkers. You got king. Some of y'all get that later. You can go frontwards and backwards. But see, we're just now coming into this thing about grace, and we're excited that our sins are forgiven and been taken away. Well, whoop de doo Listen, guys, it's like you want to compare yourself to Adam. Please don't compare yourself to Adam. Adam was sinless. Do you think that impresses God? No. Come on. What impresses God? The will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? The second Adam. To bring heaven to earth. See, it, it's not impressive that your sin's gone. Now what you going to do? It's not impressive that your condemnation's gone or your guilt's gone. Now what you going to do? What you going to do with what he gave you? That is the grace he gave you. He removed it. It's gone. But then if you stay there, you're just like, well, I get to go to heaven someday. whoop de doo But I got to live in hell until he comes and gets me or I die. That don't sound like good news to me. Why? Because that's a theology outside the kingdom. That's a theology about heaven and hell. This thing was never about heaven and hell. This thing was always about the kingdom because it's always about the king. If it's about the king and the kingdom and now the king and the kingdom lives in you, quit looking for it everywhere else because it's in you. He just needs to remove the dirt to get to the gold. If you can take dominion over you, you can take dominion over everything. But this is what we do. I just can't keep from doing that. What you're in is I just can't keep from lying. Hello. I just can't keep from sinning. You know why? Because you won't keep the seed in the dirt. You won't hold on to the truth and give the truth the time to manifest on the inside of you. What your flesh does, what your dirt does, is it, 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 it convinces you that that's not you. Because it takes you back to your past to say, well, you know this is what this, and you've done this, and you've done that, and you're this, and you're that. What is that? That's the dirt. God says, you're going to have to let me remove that so I can show you the incorruptible seed that's on the inside of you. Because the incorruptible seed on the inside of you has the power to transform you. Yeah. Nothing else has the power to transform you except that seed. 
and he put it in you. He didn't put it out there somewhere. He put it in you. He written it on your head and written it on your heart. You can't get away from it. That's why even when you make that excuse, you know it's not true. You know it's not true. Listen, even after Adam did what he did, and Cain, he was rebuking Cain, God was rebuking Cain, he said, sin is at your door, but you should rule over it. That's what he told Cain. That wasn't even new covenant. What's he telling Cain? You don't have to kill him. You killed him because you wanted to kill him because you were jealous of him. So what's that jealousy? That's dirt. That's flesh. Don't tell me that you can't deal with that. What you're telling me is, I don't want to. At least be truthful. You know, I've told you this before. I told lies so much that after I started walking with God, I started to tell a story and go, oh, crap, I can't tell that. <laughs> but I told it for years to the point that I believed it to be the truth. And then it took God to show me, go, you didn't do that. I'm like, I don't know that. <laughs> now, what was the lie doing? The lie was trying to make me feel better about myself. So I would tell you things to impress you so you would feel better about me. But really what I'm showing you is I don't know who you are, and, and I'm not very confident in who I am, so I have to present somebody that I'm not, and hopefully you'll believe it and know that I'm not lying. Because my issue is I'm gold, but I'm covered in dirt. And as long as I'm covered in dirt, all I see is dirt. I don't see the gold. I don't see the value. Until you value yourself and understand what God made you, then nobody else will value you. And as long as you're lying about yourself, then people are going to lie to you. Because you're judging yourself and it's coming back on you. You can't get away from it. You just got to let him remove the dirt. Remember, I'm from Oklahoma sooner or later. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. Let's get into the message. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What's he wanting to restore? Now, understand the question. The question is, will you restore the kingdom? So it shows me right there they have no understanding of what the kingdom is. Their understanding of the kingdom is what David was operating in, which is a natural force set up on the earth with David sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning <coughs> over his enemies. That's what they thought he was coming to bring. Are you following me? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which your father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, into Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. This is what I want you to see. He did not tell them that the kingdom was not going to be restored. It's just not going to be the way you think it is. Because he was going to bring the kingdom from the outside to the inside. And he wasn't going to have one king. He's going to have... Do you see how far low they were hitting? They were thinking, oh, this is going to come. Jesus, you're going to be set up to be king. There's going to be one king. He's going to rule over over. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the king of kings, but I'm bringing a kingdom, which is going to be my authority structure, which is going to be the true Israel, Galatians says, and I'm going to put it in you. And now he switched the word from Basilia, authority, to dunamis, power. So now he says, now you're going to go wait for power. And the dunamis power is going to be in you, watch this, to now operate from the authority structure of the kingdom. And the reason I'm doing that is so you can be my witnesses all over the earth. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. Are you following me? See, for you to be kingdom, you cannot have the power of God. Okay, let me say it like this. If you believe in the kingdom message, you must demonstrate the power of God. See, they misunderstood the structure. The structure they thought was going to be a earthly. As far as one king over the planet, the way David was king and then Solomon and they had peace over all their enemies. He's saying, no, 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 no. 
I'm going to give you power where that structure of authority is going to be in you. Then you release it out of you. So it's not going to be in one general location in Israel. It's going to be all over the planet. My kingdom's going to be everywhere at once. That's why it's so important that if you understand if he's king over you, then he can be king over everything. Because creation is waiting for you. All of creation is what? Waiting for the manifestation of the sons. What? To understand the kingdom is in them and their kings. (laughs) Now when he had spoken these things, while they washed, he was taken up and a cloud received them out of their sight. Now, the cloud was not a physical cloud. It was the witnesses. Remember in Hebrews chapter 11? It talks about the great cloud of witnesses, and it tells you who they were. That's the great cloud of witnesses received them, received him out of their sight. Why is this important? <clears throat> because we're about to get to something that's going to help you, not shock you. See, they understood this because they understood what the cloud represented. The cloud represented God's presence. The cloud to you represents rain. See, the cloud to them is what would come over the Holy of Holies when God would manifest himself. See, a mountain to you represents a mountain. A mountain to them represented the law. So when Jesus said, say to this mountain and to be thou removed, you're still trying to move mountains in Mexico. Because we know they ain't none here around Houston. <laughs> How many of y'all ever known somebody to move a mountain? I mean, a physical mountain. Have y'all ever seen one move? Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about moving inch. He said it'll be thrown into the sea. Now, here's the other thing you don't know what the sea means. See, God spoke in parabolic and symbolic language that you don't understand, but the Jews understood it. Because that's how they talk. That's how they live. Everything is symbolic to them. Oh, are, you underst- are you following me? Okay. Luke 22. See, this is one of those Wednesday night messages. Luke 22. Now watch what he does here. Verse 29. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now I want you to get this. He said, I'm going to bestow on you, talking to his 12 disciples, he said, I'm going to put on you a kingdom that was put on me. And that's good. I mean, that's what that co-heir thing means. That means, you know, I'm going to show you that what I do, you can do. And if I'm a son, you're a son. And if I've inherited all things, you've inherited all things. But what I want to show you is they did not understand that. They didn't understand what he was talking about. Now, that's okay because most of us don't understand what he was talking about. Because we don't understand what he promised Abraham and what he promised David. And we don't understand above everything else, God has to fulfill his word or he would cease to be God. If his word means nothing, his name means nothing, so why are you praying anything in Jesus' name? You don't even know why you say in Jesus' name. You say it, why? Because you were told to say it. Come on, that's what we do when we pray. We pray and bless this food in Jesus' name. And we prophesy in Jesus' name. What are you saying? If you're doing it in Jesus' name, you're saying if Jesus was here, I'm supposed to get the same results as if Jesus was saying this himself. That's what it means. I'm invoking Jesus' authority because I'm co-heirs with him. So I'm speaking as if Jesus was speaking. Now go ahead and say in Jesus' name when you want to pray. And see, it's not just done out of tradition. It means something. 
Luke 22, he's bestowing a kingdom on them. Look at verse 24, chapter 24, verse 27. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented. And Jesus turned to them, saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For then days, indeed the days are coming when they will be blessed of the barren wombs that never bore and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say, To these mountains fall upon us, and to the hills cover us. If they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry wood? In other words, when Jesus was there and what he was saying, in the end of that, compared to what it's going to be when he's gone. Okay? And this is something we reference that happened in the book of Revelation. All right? Last week. So we see this, and then remember when Jesus came back from the dead. And when he came back from the dead, there was these guys walking on the road to Emmaus. And he shows up, and you can read that story, and they're perplexed. And they're perplexed because Jesus has died, and they thought he was the Messiah. Are you following me? And then what happens, he starts to go back from Moses and tells them all the scriptures of the prophets that said they all pointed to him. And what was he doing? He's saying, look, guys. Y'all are so perplexed because it didn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. I didn't do it the way you thought I was going to do it. But do you saying, understand, every one of these passages are talking about me. Now, to us, we're like, well, what's the big deal? Because that means to them that they understood everything that came through the prophets, Abraham, all of them, that Jesus was the fulfillment of it, and now he is raised from the dead. And they understood this when he disappeared in front of their eyes. Now, this takes on a whole new meaning for them. Are you following me? Yeah. It takes on a whole new understanding for them. So, so stay with me this next 10 minutes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Because this is what's going to help you. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit's come. They're up in the, waiting on the power. They're waiting on the new structure. See, they don't know what it is. They know power is going to come, but they don't know what the new structure is. They don't realize they are the new structure. Wow. Come on, you, you need to understand, you are the way God's going to do it. Yeah. That's why I'm so vehemently against the rapture. Yeah. Why? Because you're still saying, God's going to do it. And he's saying, God's going to do it. Because you are the new structure now. He's not the structure. He was the structure when he was on the planet. Now he gave you his position to be on the planet. So for him to come the way most churches think he's going to come, actually he has to break his own word. It goes against his character and everything that he stood for. Why? Because he shifted everything out of a building into people. And he told them, now this is the new structure. And to prove to the new structure, I'm going to put my spirit in them, which is the power of God, for them to be the witnesses into the other most parts of the earth, which numbers prophesied and said what? The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's you. That's not him glory coming from heaven somewhere. That's you that's come from heaven. Now, we say, well, then how come it's not happening? Because until you find the gold in you and take the dominion and authority in you, you'll never have the dominion and authority outside of you. So if you're not overcoming stuff in you, it's going to be hard for you to overcome stuff outside of you. Did y'all get that? The greatest anointing you have is for you. Because it's your land. It's your dirt. And you have authority over your dirt, you can help somebody else get rid of theirs. But quit digging on somebody else's dirt when you ain't doing no excavation on your own. <laughs> Somebody know what I'm talking about there. <clears throat> so here's Peter. They've been filled. They think they're drunk, right? Look what he says. And it shall come to pass. Here's Peter. He starts preaching. It'll come to pass in the last days, says God. So he's saying, you know, this is what Joel prophesied. So it was Joel a prophet. So Jesus had to fulfill it. Okay. So Peter's making reference 
to a prophet that Jesus fulfilled. And here you're seeing the manifestation of it coming to earth. Even though Jesus fulfilled it, there can still be time between the manifestation and the fulfillment. Okay. Let me help you. He fulfilled your healing on the cross. You may not have your healing now. May be time for the manifestation of it, but he fulfilled it on the cross. And it came to pass in the last day, he says, God, I'll pour my spirit out on. So how many knows it wasn't just 120 that got it? All flesh got it, even though they didn't realize they got it. See, some of y'all got stuff y'all don't even know y'all got. That I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men so shall the, see visions. Young men, your old men will see dreams. And on my men servants, my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heaven and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon into the blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How many like that? Saved from what? Come on, let me ask you this question. Save from what? Here's the first message. Have they been empowered in the kingdom? Okay, now the people that killed Jesus are in the city. These 120 are waiting to become the new structure. They know they got it. The other people don't know they got it yet. And then when they see them, they go, they're drunk. And then Peter comes out and starts preaching this message. Watch what he says. Let's see who he's talking to. Verse 22. Men of Israel. Who's he talking to? Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God, to who you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered... By the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have been taken by the lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You ready? For David, now this don't mean nothing to you. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced, my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You've made known to me the ways of life. You will make full my joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and in his tomb and is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor his flesh saw corruption. This Jesus has raised up, which we were all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Now, now let me decipher what just happened. <laughs> These are Jews. They know the law and they know the prophets. They know who Abraham is. They know who David is. They just crucified the Lord. Fifty days later, they're celebrating Passover. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter and him come out drunk. Right? In other words, I mean, you know, it had to be noticeable. Now, you have to understand they also who knew who Isaiah was. And Isaiah was one that prophesied a stammering lip will be a sign to you. So they come out and they're going, and these guys going, them boy are drunk. And Peter said, let me tell you something. Oh, we're drunk, all right. But not like you think. 
And all of a sudden, he starts to tell them what they did and who Jesus was. And they start confirming to them the prophet David. And that now he is the fulfillment of that prophecy that your seed will sit up on a throne. Well, to do that, he had to be resurrected. Are you following me? And they all know that they call Jesus the son of David. That's why in Matthew 1, 1, it's the son of Abraham, the son of David. Because he's come to fulfill both of those covenants. So now he's telling them, and you killed him. I mean, like that message. And he starts to tell them what they did. And what they did now has brought forth now the resurrection but the fulfillment of what was prophesied to David. Because he is a son of David. He's sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. Has that happened? Yes, yes it is fulfilled. Yes. Right? Yes? yes? Hang on, we're going to go somewhere. I've got to go quick. So he said, Lord and Christ. So, so let me tell you what, this is both covenants. What he's saying is he is Messiah and King. Let me show you. Abraham took his son up to be sacrificed. He didn't sacrifice him because God provided his own sacrifice. But it was a type and shadow of father sacrificing his own son. Which would make him Lord. But he's saying not only this is a fulfillment of the story of Abraham and the sacrificial of his son... The resurrection not only makes him Lord, it makes him Christ. So not only does it make him Lord, it makes him king. Now, we know he was already king, but to them is the understanding that it's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that tells them that he's going to sit on the throne as a king, son of David. Are you following me? So he's saying and showing them these two covenants have been fulfilled, and you killed the guy that did it. This really was the Messiah. Do you understand the message here? Okay. Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, And as many as the Lord will call. And with many other words, he testified, exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse. Okay, I did all that just to get to that verse. (laughs) Right? Because it don't mean nothing to you. If you was here last week, it should mean something. Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. He said, in the latter days, this is a song of Moses, and he's telling them, he's telling Israel, you're going to be a wicked and perverse generation. And I will turn to, from you to another generation, to another nation that's not a nation. It's not even looking for me. Are you following me? Yeah. Matthew 17, 17, you see Jesus calling them a perverse and wicked generation. You see him over and over in the gospel saying, you're you're a wicked and adulterous generation, always looking for a sign. I will not give you one except for the sign of Jonah. Philippians 2.15, you'll see Paul call them a wicked and adulterous generation. But here you see Peter come out in the first message he ever preached. And we, we listen to this today and we try to apply it to ourselves. He was not talking to you. He's talking to them. And he's preaching The fulfillment of both covenants. And he's saying, repent of your sins. What is your sins? You've believed in the law to save you. There's only one. It's called unbelief. He said, repent of it. Remember what Jesus came? Repent. Change your mind for the kingdom is here. Come on. So he's making reference when he says, and be saved from this wicked and perverse generation. When they hear this, they're going, oh, my gosh. This is what was prophesied by Moses. Hello. And now these guys, we're seeing the manifestation of the stammering lip 
that was prophesied by Isaiah. That it would be a sign to us. Are you following me? And they're telling us that this Lord and this sign is that he's alive and he's been resurrected. Which is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant. Are you following me? So when they hear this, it's not because Peter was this great teacher. I mean, he's half drunk. He probably don't even know what he was saying. And so when they do this, he said, now repent and save yourself, not from, from hell, save yourself from this wicked and adulterous generation. What was wrong with that generation? They, their hearts were hardened. They were stiff-necked, and they di- wouldn't receive the Messiah. They wanted the law, and they were trying to do it themselves. Are you following me? And so then that, this is what happens. Then they go, then what do we got to do to be saved? And it says they were pricked in their hearts. Come on, first time you see that they were pricked in their hearts. It come from the inside out. Are you following me? Okay, I'm almost done. Just give me just a few more minutes. Now, when he does this, how many get saved? 3,000. When Moses come down off the mountain, how many died? 3,000. Do you get that? Under the law, he's showing 3,000 died. Grace comes 3,000, just like that. But here's the important thing. What was the message? The message was the fulfillment of all the covenants in the old. And he is the fulfillment. Why is that so important? Because he was telling you that he's doing a new thing and there's going to be a new covenant. It's not going to be between man and man. It's going to be between man and God. And he's the God man. He's going to be both sides of the covenant. But to do this, he had to fulfill the rest. So we see him take all the Mosaic covenant, all the plagues, everything that was on there. He had to take it. But he also had to fulfill everybody will be blessed. All nations will be blessed because of the promise he made to Abraham. Not only that, but he was going to sit on the throne of king. He's going to be a king of kings. I think if you're a king, you should be blessed. Now, does, has everybody understood that? No. But did he do it for everybody? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Romans 10, and we'll quit. I can do this one quick. Romans 10. Verse 6. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend in heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Does anybody know where that comes from? It comes from Moses. And Moses was telling the children of Israel this statement. Come on, I read it to you last week. Okay? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Not even talking to you. Still talking to them of what Jesus did, the Mosaic covenant and fulfilling the Davidic, hello, and the Abrahamic covenant. Proof. The guy that wrote Romans 10, the Romans wrote, guess what? Never said the prayer. The one that told you how to get saved never said the prayer. He's on his way to kill Christians and has an encounter with God. (laughs) Okay. Why is this so important? Because some of you are holding on to that prayer you prayed, so you think you're saved. And you think it's about heaven and hell. Oh. The whole thing. You say, well, how does that relate to us? I'm glad you ask. Because the whole point, you find it in what he told them at the beginning of the book of Acts, which is, I'm changing my structure. 
I'm changing my authority and I'm putting the kingdom in you and I'm going to give you power to demonstrate it, which will be witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. What does that mean? If you just said a prayer and you have no power, what was your prayer in? Because you were just praying, oh, I'm receiving Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. How do you receive somebody that's already there? It's not receiving him into your life. It's acknowledging that he's already there. Because he's not saving you from a wicked and perverse generation anymore. Matter of fact, he told you you're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen generation. He was telling them what was coming to the Gentiles. Once this thing starts to play out, you don't see any of the things that they dealt with spoken to the Gentiles. Why? Gentiles don't know who Abraham is. Gentiles don't know who David is. Gentiles don't know who Moses is. You think I'm talking about them, but there's a whole generation out there. They don't know who Moses is. They don't know who David is. They don't know who Abraham is. And what are we teaching them? Hey, say this prayer and you don't have to go to hell and you can go to heaven. But if you don't, he's going to barbecue you. He's saying, that's nothing what he was saying. He said, I come to fulfill all these covenants and this is why. Because I'm going to make you a king. Psalms 110 says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here, watch this, until I make your enemies. The Jews knew this because they knew when the Messiah came, he was going to be a sign of what? He was going to rule and reign over their enemies, just like David did. But it's not a natural kingdom. It's a natural kingdom. And your enemies are not Iraq. Get ready. Should I go there? Some of y'all that wanted us to blow up Iran, you're not understanding the kingdom. Did you know there's a movement right now in Iran and thousands and thousands are encountering God? See, when you just become pro-American and you're not pro-kingdom, you have a wrong mindset of what God's doing on the planet. Because Iranians, Iranians are just as important to God as you are. That's just as much his sons and daughters as you. They're not Ishmael anymore. And we're not Isaac anymore. Oh, come on now. I, I know I'm messing with you, but I want you to understand how your prayers have got to change. See, if, you, if you're just being where it's just about you and heaven and hell, that's very immature. Now, did God use that? Absolutely. Come on, a lot of people just wanted fire insurance. He used it. But don't stay a baby. I mean, quit going around and your whole message is, I ain't going to hell. No, you living in it. Because if that's your mindset, you're actually in torment. Because you're not living life and life abundantly. Amen. Oh, you understand? What, what is hell? Hell is torment, period. Whatever you want to call it, whatever you think it is, afterlife, hell is torment. How many of y'all like torment? Is that what Jesus brought? No, he brought life, life more abundantly. So wherever you're in torment, that's hell. Okay. And the reason most people are in there is because they've been taught a gospel that was to the Jews. It wasn't to the Gentiles. But the good news of this, he's saying, listen, everything I did for them, you get grafted into it. So Abraham's your daddy, so I'm blessed. David's your daddy, so I'm a king. Okay, hang on. This is the end. Remember, I preach the kingdom has no beginning and no end. <laughs> Watch this. Psalms 110. Because when you hear it, you think rule and reign out there. Tarzan. <laughs> the Lord said to my Lord, sit here till I make your... What's your enemy? You are. Your dirt man's your enemy. Iraqis are not your enemy. The Ayatollah Khomeini is not your enemy. Come on, guys. These guys are not your enemy. Your enemy is your thinking, the way you see it. I'm just going to be honest with you. Your political views. You're Democrat and Republican. 
You're, you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Pro-Obama, anti-Obama. You're, oh yeah, I ain't getting, I'm gonna go over here. Your opinion on how it should be done. Your idea, why? Because you're pro-American. God's not pro-American. I'm going to say this one. He's not even pro-Israel. Sorry. He's pro-kingdom. And in his kingdom, he said, there ain't no black and white. There ain't no Israel in America. There ain't no Ishmael and Isaac. There's only those in Christ. <laughs> and in that, this is what I've given you. I am now sitting as king in you, which is king of kings, until all of your enemies are made my footstool. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. So when death has no more fear, death has lost its sting. That's why when we're talking about immortality, the issue is not immortality. Come on, you're not, your spirit man don't die. But see, you've got to quit trying to get it here. And you understand this gospel all takes you to a person. And the number one attribute of the kingdom is hearing his voice. And I'll be honest with you, when I hear Nancy Pelosi, I need to hear his voice. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. When I read some of Donald Trump's tweets, I need to hear his voice. Come on, don't that. Listen, quit being on one side or the other. You got to start to hear what God is saying in the midst of this thing because he cares for humanity. It's the most prized possession upon the planet. And we become way too much this way or that way. Now, why am I saying that? Is because that's what the Jews did. And we're doing the same thing again. Because the Jews thought it was all about them. Watch this. They thought it was all about them. So when it was so much bigger than just them, they rejected it. Oh, some of y'all just got hit right there, right? Twenty eyes. They rejected it. You know why? Because he said you gotta love your neighbor. Well, who's our neighbor? Not them Samaritans, them a bunch of dogs. Not them Democrats or them Republicans. Not them Iraqis or Iranis. Not them North Koreans. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do Israel because the Bible says to. Y'all know what I'm talking about, guys. Not them Chiefs because we're playing them today. See, this, let me, watch it. This is what maturity looks like. This is what maturity looks like. Can you pray for the people in Iran? I'm talking about really pray and really mean it. Or are you praying, I hope an American dies and we're going to blow them off the face of the planet. Well, isn't that the same spirit that they want to blow Israel off the face of the planet? I'm just asking a question. I'm, isn't that the same spirit of what they're saying about Israel? But now you're going, oh, you mess with us. We're going to take care of you. Really? And thousands are encountering Jesus over there. And you want to kill them all. Oh, he just got real in his Presbyterian church. Listen, guys, I'm just telling you what he's telling me. It's just as uncomfortable for me that it is you. Because I got dirt on my goal just like you got dirt on your goal. I got opinions just like you got opinions. And so now when he's showing him, I say, I have no opinion about that, God. I bless them. I release your goodness over them. I release encounters over them. I release your grace over them. I release your will over every single. Come on, you understand what I'm saying? Now, watch this. And I am quitting. That means nothing if you can't do it for your own enemies in you. 
You understand what I'm saying? If you can't forgive your sister, it's going to be hard for you to forgive Iran. Because you don't have dominion over your own life. So you have no power released in that prayer that goes to them. 2020 is releasing our gold, and our gold is L-O-V-E. Not the way the world determines it. This is, this is it. This is what it means. Because the old said, love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that awesome? But most people don't love their self. And Jesus said, I come to give a new command. Love your neighbor as I love you. How did he love you? He got in the dirt with the prostitute. Come on. They wanted to. Call fire down on his enemies. What'd he say? You don't even know what spirit you're from. Watch this. Did you know they had the authority to do it? Did you know they were still learning? What Peter did with Ananias and Sapphira was not good. Why? Because they were learning. And we use it as, oh, you better watch out. Use God to kill you. That's not the character of God. But Peter and them were learning. And so Peter had the power to operate in the old structure and killed two people because of it. Oh, yeah. Come on, listen, guys. This is what Elisha did to Gehazi. Elijah blessed Elisha. What did Elisha do? He cursed Gehazi. Was Gehazi wrong? Absolutely. But what did he do? He said, now I release leprosy upon you and your children. Hello. Maybe that's why Elisha died of a sickness. Wow. Yeah. Are, are y'all understand what I'm saying? I know I'm prolonging this, but I'm, I'm, I'm meddling. This is deep stuff, guys. This is not Sunday morning messages. This is what God's dealing with in 220. He wants you to see clearly, you, and to deal with these opinions. Because most of what we're dealing with is what we're sowing. And if you don't see it in you, you don't realize you're, you're doing this. And now you're reaping what you're speaking about somebody else because they are you. All right, stand up with me. I'll, I'll quit. <coughs> so I want you to ask yourself this question as we leave here this morning. What am I saved from? Because he wasn't talking to us about a wicked and perverse generation. That's all been judged and removed. Now we have a kingdom that has no end. So we got a shift into the new covenant, which is you're a chosen generation. Who? Everybody. You're a real royal priesthood. Who? Everybody. You're a king and a priest. Who? Everybody. So why are you judging kings and priests? Why are you condemning them? Well, you know them Muslims. Stop. Stop. Well, you know the people that worship Buddha. You know that fat man rubbing his belly. Stop. Because when you do that, you're judging yourself. I pray for you. Sing on just a second. I saw a whirlwind over the top of your head. Things is going to get faster and faster and faster. And you've been confused even about who you are and the identity of who God's called you to be. And God says, you don't have to figure it out. I place it on the inside of you. And if you'll allow me, I'll start to show you. Even from a young child and the disappointment and the abandonment that you've had to go through. And even with the suicide thoughts of, does anybody even care? Is this worth it? And you've thought about it in it yourself. And God stepped in when you didn't even realize it was him. And God says, I protected you in the midst of the storm. But God says, now it's shifting. Because what once was trying to take you out now is removing everything that's caused that doubt, that's caused that shame, that's caused that blame. God says, I'm setting you in who I have called you to be. So there's an awakening that's happening on the inside of you. 
so that you can see, understand, and no longer be in fear of your future. So, Father, I just release this over him. I bless him in his identity. I release encounters into his life. I say, let him see that he's a king and he's a priest, that he can rule and reign and have life and life more abundantly in this time, Father, in Jesus' name. The, uh, the, the guy in the red and black plaid, can I pray for you? Yeah, will you come? There's some things that's happening in your family. It's not just happening in you, it's happening in your family. This is a year that God does things and brings the generations together. And I saw trees in front of you where you couldn't see the field that God has for you. And I saw God go before you and I saw him whack these trees out of the way. I mean, it's like he was just moving them like this. And God says things that have hindered your sight and hindered the way you see. It's even caused you to see yourself in the wrong way. God says, I'm removing those obstacles. And the very identity of what I've placed in you is going to start to come for the forefront. And you're going to start to see the value. There was a disvaluing of your life between the age of 6 and 12 years old. There was a trauma in your life that has affected you. And God says, I'm going deep into the recesses of your heart, and I'm removing that out of the way, showing that I was there. And healing that and bringing, and I hear this, a man to man. He's bringing this identity to you, a man to man. And he's going to show you that what you didn't get in one way, he's giving it to you in another way. He says, I'm a father to the fatherless. And that didn't mean you didn't have a dad. It just, it just means there's some things that God does that an earthly daddy cannot do. And he's doing that for you to show you who you are because you're going to be one that has the influx measure of favor upon men. They're going to be drawn to you. Not because of what you do or what you say. It's just because God has given that to you to have a voice. God says in the midst of this, quit comparing yourself amongst yourself. Don't look at one brother on this side and another brother on this side. You're not him and you're not him. You're individually and wonderfully made for the call that God has for you. And God's committed to see you walk this out. And there's a business anointing upon your life. I don't know what you do now, but God's saying he wants to bring business into you where you're an owner. You're not just a worker for somebody. You're an owner. It's an entrepreneurship that's on the inside of you that I want to give you your own. And I want to show you my goodness and my grace. And I want to give you the ability to help even your family. You've seen ones that have gone without and your heart has wanted to help them. God says, if you'll trust me, I'll put resources into your hands where it's not just a handout but it's something that you're able to do and say God did this for me and I want to be a blessing to you to show you how good my God is so father I release this over his life I bless him in the identity of who you called him to be father in Jesus name amen hold your hands out with me this morning come on I hear this I hear God saying as we've moved into this new year (coughs) he wants to deal with your doubt and your fear of missing out and not understand but God says you got to quit listening just to a man hear my voice and understand you've always been my choice and I'm opening your eyes so that you can see for this is a year of this intimacy that I bring you in close so that you know who I am and in the midst of this I am releasing who you are called to be and what you are called to see. So as you walk from this place, understand it's available, it's my grace, that empowers you in your identity so that you can walk and not be in fear, so that you can trust me because I'm always near. I live on the inside and I want out, but to do that with that, I've got to deal with your doubt. I've got to show you who I am so you can see who you are. So trust me, I'm not far. I'm right there, and I'll walk you through. And I challenge you in this. This is what I want to do. 
an open door for you to walk through and understand it belongs to you. For I have chosen you before the foundations of the world. Move into your identity. Receive what's already yours. Trust that it belongs to you. And as you do this, you will start to see I'm the one that sees it through. You will not have to work and make it happen and try to understand. For you see, I'm the God man. And I made you just like me. So allow this intimacy. I will start to give encounters. I will start to show myself strong. It'll not just come through services. It'll not just come through what somebody else says. I'm invading your world. I'm invading your life. I need you just to trust without any strife. No longer any anxiety of how to make it happen or what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to rest and let me see it through. It's always been my plan. It's always been my plan to make man just like me. So trust, trust me, what I started, I will finish. Because it's my name that is on the line. So trust me, you're gonna be just fine. So Father, I release your word over them today. I say, let them trust the seed that's on the inside of them. Let them yield to what already has been done. So where they used to walk, now they can run. Where it used to be pain, now it can be fun. Oh, oh, it all happens because of the Son. Father, we release your goodness. We release your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are released.